At this time on our agenda, we're going to open it up for public input or comments. Just a reminder that this is general public input or comment. I do understand, however, that employee appreciation went uh, a little bit longer than normal. And so uh, if you have comments for the public hearing and you aren't able to stay, we will allow that to take place at this time. Our preference, however, is that public comments get made after hearing the presentations and the questions so that they're as informed as they can be. But if you're on a time crunch, uh, this is the time for public input or comments. The comments are limited to three minutes, and please direct them to the board. My name is Lori Taylor. I live here in Coopville on 6th Street which I affectionately refer to the Lower East Side because it's the coolest part of town. <laughs> I wanted to, I always love coming to these meetings where you do the awards because it's, it's just nice to see who's coming in and who's been working for the county. So I just want to thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I'm speaking on behalf of the group Coopville Community Allies. We're a group of citizens and business owners and veterans in Coopville and Central Whitby whose concern is balancing community and military operations. I myself am a business owner and have lived on Whitby Island for most of the last 25 years. 12 of those as a military wife of a proud pilot. CCA is grateful for this opportunity to begin a conversation regarding compatibilities or incompatibilities between military operations and land use. This isn't about the trail per se, but the trail has brought this up. CCA's concern remains addressing the predicted incompatibilities between the growl expansion and current land use, especially as it pertains to accident potential zones or APZs. APZs are warranted for flight patterns with more than 5,000 operations per year, noting that a touch and go landing represents two operations. Uh, APZs are drawn, uh, you guys are probably letting those, to show the areas most likely to experience a crash. APZ 1, 5,000 feet off the clear zone, has the highest risk category, and then APZ 2, which also has a higher risk category but not as high, is 7,000 feet off of APZ 1. Once an APZ is established, land use within that APZ is severely restricted. The Department of Defense has guidelines and a version of these is codified in the Island County Code as there are APZs for all field, but none yet for Coopville. Two of the three scenarios in the Navy's draft environmental impact statement will require the establishment of APZs. While the Navy provided conceptual APZs in the DEIS, the actual APZs will not be known until the EIS is published, a decision of record is made, and the Navy undertakes another Air Installations Compatible Use Zone Study, or AQs. So right now we don't know exactly where those APZs will need to be. Based on the Navy's conceptual APZs, however, in the DEIS, and in comparison with the Island County Code, the following are currently incompatible uses that exist, existing incompatible uses with APZ-1. Whidbey Animals Improvement Foundation, the Rhododendron Park Campground, Ryan's House for Youth, the Island County Solid Waste Transfer Station, the Island Transit Headquarters, Central Whidbey Gun Club, Central would be fire and rescue at the race road station and it would prohibit, they're going out for a bond next year, it would prohibit any further construction for that, and the Admiral's Cove neighborhood, as well as other general categories including home-based businesses and any vacation rentals like Airbnb or VRBO. Unlike the DOD guidelines which do not allow any housing in APZ-1, housing is allowed in APZ-1 in Island County. DOD only allows two dwellings per acre in APZ-2, while, while Island County does not appear to have restrictions for single-family residences other than saying no planned residential developments shall occur within the clear zone, APZ-1 or APZ-2. A PRD allows a planned residential development or is a neighborhood, and Admiral's Cove clearly falls into both APZ-1 and APZ-2. CCA opens to open a dialogue with you to help find answers to the following questions. First, how will the currently incompatible land uses be resolved as they seem to be significant? Secondly, establishment of APZs will require a moratorium on future property uses that are incompatible with APZ. How will this be done? And third, how will landowners be compensated for the loss of value? CCA has worked with the Island County Assessor's Office to find that there is a 1.3 billion in property values under the current noise contours. It is estimated that 30 to 40, I'm almost done, 30% of those properties, or approximately 445 million in value, will be affected by APZs. Ms. Taylor, yes. I need you to wrap up. I will. Well, there's a lot. I understand. Today, so three minutes, really, I need to stay close to it. Like this is that, if, we, if we can stop talking, I will. I will do that. Wow. Commissioner Johnson, you've been so establishment of APZs is a taking of property and a reduction of value. As taxpayers, we are concerned about how owners will be compensated for this loss. We hope that the entire board will dedicate itself to solving these issues of current incompatible land use that involve much more risk than a hiking trail, which is currently not Thank prohibited by APZ learned. one or two. Your time is up. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else here for public? Oh, you called 
the mayor. I apologize. And just a reminder, this is general public comment unless you're on a time crunch. Uh, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. I am Bob Severins, uh, mayor of the city of Oak Harbor. Oak Harbor, as you know, is the largest city in Island County, and, and uh, we, at our <coughs> citizen count is 22,500. I can tell you that a majority of the, uh, of the citizens in Oak Harbor and on North Whitby would feel pretty much like the uh, lady that just spoke before me. I would strongly recommend that you uh, uh, work to develop uh, fight zones around OLF. Um, also, uh, want to tell you that I'm here to make a deal, actually. I've, I've handed uh, my economic development plan to you. Uh, you'll get a copy of that. I have five uh, bullet points. Um, one of those bullet points is a trail in Oak Harbor that, that goes from Mailer Point, which we currently have, but we'll have more use of that as time goes on as far as the military is concerned. Have that trail wrap around all the way to uh, Fort Nugent. Um, and and I, um, I will spend my time and money to enhance that trail and would, would like the, uh, the county's support on that. So that's my deal. Um, uh, we're ready up there, and uh, thank you very much for the time. Thank you, Mayor. Good morning. <clears throat> my name is uh, Matt McDowell. I moved here 45 years ago. I'm here this morning regarding the request for our tax dollars to help build trails under jet noise zones. I congratulate you on a job well done and for having the courage to do what you know is the right thing by knowing the issues and applying common sense to those difficult issues. Saying yes to a room full of people wanting our tax dollars for their projects is easy. However, saying no to that group is not only extremely difficult, but can be actually painful personally. There is a relatively small group trying to shut down the best training location in the Navy the Navy has in the Northwest for training pilots to safely land on carriers, that being OLF group bill. Plus some of that group would like to shut down the NES Whitby for carrier landing training. This group says the noise created by the jets practicing carrier landings is harmful to people's health. Having studied and being involved for 27 years on jet noise issue, I do not believe it is a health hazard because the actual duration of the time a person is subjected to that noise is, uh, is, is short. However, I absolutely believe it is a huge annoyance and irritation. Having observed for 16 years as county commissioner the rep repetitive health studies done by Allen County as well as the other 38 counties studies, there is absolutely no indication there is a demonstrated health problem in Allen County. In fact, for many of the issues the group claims are health problems, Allen County leads most other counties in good health in those areas. However, it is not important to your decision if it is a health issue or an annoyance. You realize it is not good common sense to use our taxpayers to create more conflict between people and then the jet noise. Knowingly concentrating people in an area impacted by the jet noise is not good governance. You commissioners can't do anything about existing encroachments, but certainly you do not need to create new encroachments with tax dollars. If people want to build a home on their property using their own money, and they know the Navy has been flying jets over their property for 50 years, fine, more power to them. But do not use tax dollars to bring more people into those noise zones. You understand if a carrier jet base because of additional encroachments loses the best runway for training its air crews, that base would likely shut down or at a minimum the carrier base, their planes and air crews that base would need to relocate to a different base. At NES would be the carrier jet is the growler and represents about half the base. Even if the base was not closed, immediately losing half of NES jobs or finally closing the base entirely, the economic impact of losing half of all of the 88% uh, economic activity the base, base brings to the county will be catastrophic. Please continue to use your common sense and do not use our tax dollars to concentrate more people in impacted loud noise zones. I apologize, I have a prior commitment and that's why I spoke at this time. Thank you. Thank you. So I have a long list up here for people who signed up for public comment. It's not tied to the hearing. And everybody on this list wants to speak at public comment and not tied to the public hearing. I just want to make sure that that I'm going. So I'll just call your name and you can decide if you're coming up now or at the public hearing. Mr. Erickson, you've already decided. I've already decided. Yeah, to come up now. 
I guess I have, but I don't want to talk about the Navy at this time. I want to talk about an entirely different subject that's not on your agenda. Perfect. Totally. I may want to talk about the Navy later. That's totally fine. I just yeah, want to okay. make sure I'm so, not messing up my list. Right. Uh, Steve Erickson, for the record, speaking for myself this time, on an entirely different subject, uh, you're all aware of the housing crunch on the island, severe housing crunch. I know of at least three people, longtime residents, who have basically lost where they're living because their rents were tripled. And I do mean literally tripled, in one case from $900 to $2,700 a month. Um, this is, you know, is a region-wide problem, increase in housing costs. And I think that some response from the county is in order here. And frankly, I think it's time for the county to start looking at rent control, controlling the levels of rents, procedures for increasing them, because what we have now is just, um, you know, it's just total rampant gentrification, if you will, with longtime residents getting kicked out. It's your friend Joe Kunzler here, uh, or at least I hope I'm still your friend after today. But uh, I want to talk about the per the permit at the permit time, and I want to talk about something else that was brought up earlier, namely the ACUS issue, Commissioner Johnson. If that's okay, it's your time. Thanks so much. You having fun this morning? You talk to us. We don't talk back. Okay. It's your time. All right. Um, well, we're here at the line of demarcation for operation would be verification. Some say it's. Uh, it, okay, that's uh, that's about the grant, so I'm going to go faster. Um, you know, I, I wanted to come before the county commissioners today and at public comment time and just kind of, I think, one approach with this aid cruise issue that Lori Taylor courageously brought up and has been bringing up on her Facebook page, Coopville Community Allies. I've even shared the post on my pages after Joe Productions, so my side of the aisle is aware of this upcoming situation. And I think it would be very helpful to have a study group of all efforts and town of Coopville officials and Navy officials and Island County officials and EBs and HR advocates to take a good long look at those at the ACU study. Um, I think if we had a study group that met at least once monthly and learned more about the ACUs ahead of time, then maybe we can get a jump start and fine tune this, uh, these recommended recommendations so that we're pro Navy, but we're also pro EVs and HR. And I think if we could find a way to do that, let's do that. You know, not everybody in EVs and HR is a core member. And we all know what I think of them. Um, you know, I really don't, well, I, I also have to say on a personal political level that uh, I'm not, I, I, uh, I really hope we can get to town of Coopville this time instead of in 1988 to come to a table on the ACUs and EBs in HR because what's next? We, we, uh, we cut off all grants and just drop uh, B61 out the A3, boom, and, and then what? We're just as bad as the people we're, we're fighting. I, I, I'd rather find some middle ground. Um, you know, at some point, I just feel an obligation to protect our troops and military families from the core of bullies. That doesn't mean I have a right to be a bully as well and order a code red. Our multinational troops at NES would be Island swore an oath to uphold the U.S. Constitution or the Canadian Charter of Freedoms or the Australian Constitution. It's like what Major Dusty Cook, my Blue Angels fat Albert pilot, told me. Get out there and help spread their word. Sort of like the time the uh, NAS WI ops officer pulled me aside and, and reminded me to keep in mind during the draft EIS the, the Navy values of honor, courage, and commitment. So let's encourage new ideas and deliver bad news forthrightly. Let's overcome all challenges while adhering to the highest standards of personal conduct and decency. Let's always strive for personal change and personal improvement. There you go. And with that, thank you for listening. And I'm certainly going to have remarks come to permit time. Thank you, Mr. Kuhnsler. Karen Tolga, are you for this time or the hearing? I'd like to talk about the trails. Where does that fall under? At the hearing. Thank you. Uh, Jan Picard, hearing or hearing? Not. Or now? I just signed in. Okay. Oh, you're not even going to talk. <laughs> Garrett, are you for now or the hearing? Here. Right now. Sorry, Mr. Garrett. 
can do for Christ here for now. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, you know, as you know, my name is Garrett Newkirk, I'm a county resident, uh, family's been here for over a hundred years, <clears throat> hundred plus. What you're doing accounts to the same thing that basically Hitler did, exactly the oh. same thing, Joe? by demanding your Island County Board of Health department head, HR, any other group to say that the jet noise is not harming you is false by you demanding them to do that is holding yourself accountable and liable for any damage harm that is coming to people because as of yesterday my ears have been ringing non-stop because of the jets flying over us while we were working in our field so I, I say what, why don't you come out sometime when they're flying in our field and find out and see how bad it is for yourself and see if it is not harming you or not. Because you keep telling everybody it's not harming people, but it is. And you're lying to people. Oh. And by demanding your health official say that it isn't harming, that should hold, hold the county liable for lawsuits which would be good on your aspect because you will be held personally liable from your statements that you've made. Thank you, Mr. Newford. <laughs> Marianne and Dane, are you for general comment or the hearing? Hey, Tenet, are you for general public comment or the hearing? General. Okay. Good morning, um, Peck Tenant, Island County resident, and I want to emphasize that I am here as a private citizen, not representing any particular group or issue, and I choose not to expand on any particular concern, action, or proposal. However, I have two questions and a request. Question one, the guiding principles and mission statement found on the Island County Commissioner's website Remember that? The mission statement is quality services for a quality life. And the guiding principles are provide for the long-term health and safety of the people, the economy, and our natural resources. Delicate balance, I get it. Assure customer service and prompt operational excellence and efficiencies of Island County. Promote active participation in government. <coughs> Fulfill our constitutional responsibilities holding ourselves to a high standard of accountability, transparency, ethics, and fairness. Maintain agricultural and recreational opportunities while strengthening our economic vitality, another delicate balance. Question two, your oath of office. Prescribed by our CW, Title 36 Counties, 36.16.040, Oath of Office, it reads, I do solemnly swear or affirm that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution and laws of the State of Washington, and that I will faithfully and impartially discharge the duties of the Office of Island County Commissioner according to law, to the best of my abilities. I'm a believer in the win-win win, win concept. Through open, serious, respectful discussion, a willingness to listen for understanding, and seeking solutions together to the many, many issues that face us. My request is that you renew your commitment to your oath of office, the Island County Commissioner's stated mission and guiding principles, and that we all move forward remembering our connectedness, our love for our islands, and in the true spirit of community. Yeah. Thank you. Mary Natwood, are you here for general public comment or the hearing? Just a quick public comment. Marion Atwood, 640 Petmore Road. Uh, I'm here as an individual today. Uh, I just wanted to remind the commissioners that the State Department of Public Health has declared that noise is a public health issue. 
and that this is a fact, not an opinion. And there seems to be a lot of confusion these days in these chambers and elsewhere about the difference between fact and opinion. So I would like uh, our commissioners to keep that in mind uh, as we look at what's on the agenda for later in the day. Thank you so much. Stella, a 45-year uh, resident here of the county. Um, I've come to a few of these uh, meetings and I'm still a little bit confused. And I think one of the gentlemen just um, brought up, or one of the speakers brought that point. I, my is, question is, serious is the issue of noise. Why the county hasn't commissioned an actual noise study? that we could address an objective st noise study? And basically that is what my concern is. Thank you, Mr. Stella. Are you here for the public hearing or public comment? Linda, good. Public hearing, public, public hearing. Uh, Donna Nolan. Public hearing or public comment? The public hearing. Okay. Oh, shoot, I always get a name I can't say. Jane, Janet, Janine, Jamie, Jen. It's Jane. Jamie. Uh, the hearing. The hearing. Okay. Is there anybody else here for general public comment? Hearing? Yes, ma'am. <coughs> Good morning, I'm Ann Casey, Island County resident, and my comments follow similarly to the woman who spoke here just a few minutes ago, because I have a, a, a large, broad concern also, and that is how we are treating the public trust. And in my opinion, the public trust can be pretty much viewed as a physical body. It can take bruises, it can take a few fractures, but too many of these in the public trust become so fractured that it is a serious damage as to how institutions can operate. And so I would ask all of you to take into account the importance of what public trust means to you in your positions as commissioners, and even greater than that as Island County in general. And to use that and to be thoughtful about making decisions and how you work with each other to come to a decision, because the public trust is really what you have. And if you don't have public trust, none of us benefit. So I ask you please, and request that you please keep that in mind on deliberations today and well into the future. And I appreciate that. Thank you. Anybody else for general public comment? At this time, we'll close the general public comment period. Is there any responses from board? The second project is the walking EV's trail corridor public Trail planning and construction. Um, who will be presenting? Pat Powell, director, would be Commando Land Trust. Where do you want this? Well, where you can either sit where Don's at, or you can speak at the microphone, whichever you're more comfortable with. And not to put my back to you, but I would anyway. Could I sit on this side of the table? You can do what you want. Pat. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Executive Director would be Camino Land Trust. 
Today I'm presenting the Walking Evie's Trail Corridor uh, proposal. And to give you a um, location on the map, this is Coopville, this is the Ferry Landing, this is uh, Ford EB State Park, uh, Park Service Easements, Fort Casey State Park. The blue are existing trails, and the pink along here um, is the trail corridor um, proposal before you today. One by one, over the last 10 years, the Land Trust has worked to secure key trail easements as part of the conservation easements we've acquired from all of the pri private properties involved in our Walking Evie's Trail Corridor proposal. Under the terms of these legally binding easements, um, and reminding you that conservation easements are actually property rights that are held by the Land Trust and or Island County, uh, under the terms of these easements, the land trust has the right to construct, maintain, and operate a pedestrian trail. The trail corridor, when fully implemented, will link hikers to key destinations from the amenities in the town of Coopville, along farm fields, through forest and by wetlands, to state and county parks and land trust preserves, and down to our fabulous beaches and back. Over the past three decades, tens of millions of dollars of public funds have been used to protect lands and waters in Evie's Landing National Historical Reserve. This proposal will significantly enhance the public's opportunity to enjoy this public investment. The Walking Evie's Trail Corridor will serve the citizens of Island County as well as the thousands of visitors who help our local island economy thrive. Having a trail construction plan, which is 40,000 of the proposal, proposed 50,000, will detail what is required on each of the trail segments to construct the trail, including specific site and servicing requirements, maintenance, fencing, signage, construction needs, and the estimated cost of trail construction. 600,000 of Conservation Futures funds were used to help secure the conservation and trail easements on the 10 properties indicated on the map with the yellow stars. These easements are co-held by Island County and the Land Trust. The Land Trust will be, bring additional funds to the project to build the trail starting with the first phase. Again and again, the Land Trust has demonstrated its ability to highly leverage each dollar of conservation future funds it is granted by securing other funds. The trail construction portion of this project will be no different. In fact, the Land Trust raised another $5.3 million in federal and state grants for these 10 Yellow Star Conservation Easement acquisitions. That's an amazing tenfold increase in the county's conservation future investment in this project. The 12 criteria that you adopted two years ago for m and projects are shown here. We were given an additional six questions from you to which you've received our written answers. Having just five minutes to make this presentation, I'll highlight just a few of the criteria referring you to the grant application when you score our application today. Redirecting walkers off county roads and onto the proposed trail connectors will greatly enhance the safety of people who today must walk on 35 and 50 mile an hour county roads to connect to existing trails. Studies have found that pedestrians being hit at 40 miles per hour have a 85% chance of fatality. Pedestrians are 2.3 times more likely to die from a crash with a vehicle in a rural setting than in an urban setting. Regarding the public access criteria, an additional eight miles of new trail will be available that connect to dozens of miles of existing trails. The cost of preparing management plans is an eligible conservation futures expense. In fact, having a site-specific management plan is a high priority set by this board. This proposal meets this high priority. Our walking EB's trail corridor project is unequivocally supported in plans adopted by Island County, Town of Coopville, EB's Reserve, and State Parks. 
regarding leveraging conservation futures with other funds, I mentioned the, the 10 easements co-held by Island County and the land trust, and the fact that the land trust leveraged these funds tenfold with other monies. But much more impressively, the land trust secured more than $16 million of federal, state, land trust, and private donor funds to purchase easements and properties that are part of the trail corridor. All of these funds went to local property owners, another economic benefit to Island County. We will, of course, bring other funding and volunteer labor to, labor to the construction part of this project. As is always the case with Conservation Futures grants awarded to us, the expense of our professional staff is not paid for with Conservation Future funds, but is paid for by community members who support our conservation mission. The only uh, hike, uh, hiking data that I could receive was from State Parks. They have one counter at the bottom of the staircase at Evie's Landing. And from that information, they have said that between five and 10,000 hikers per month use the Evie's Landing Trail year around. And that's a very conservative estimate because there are many other entrances to that bluff trail. I want to show you just a few of the many trail experiences that people will be able to enjoy in a fully connected trail network through Evie's Reserve. Incredible scenic views. Walking through old growth forest and alongside working farms. Seeing special features. Being able to educate yourself at interpretive signs and have beautiful scenic overlooks getting down and playing on the beach. Iconic farmland in Evie's Reserve. Wildlife that abounds in Evie's Reserve. More iconic views. Crockett Lake wetlands. And the top of Hill Road. I have one uh, comment before I ask for questions, and that concerns the previous m and application. That application was for two years, and uh, so that would be 62,000 a year for 2017 and 2018. Two years ago, the county commissioners um, adopted at a one public hearing $500 million for buying the Fakuma Farm conservation easement. With $500,000 coming out of that year's budget and the remaining $500,000 out of the next year's budget. Because that is a two-year project that is also an option for the county commissioners to um, consider. So I am now open for questions. And I'm going to go back to the podium if you're okay with that. That's great. Thank you. Are there any questions on this particular application? I'm just curious, um, when you brought up about, yeah, and I agree that there is a safety issue, but I'm just curious because you brought it up about the um, people being struck by vehicles, and I was just curious how many people have we had struck in the past year or five years when there have been any deaths? I don't know the answer. This one. Yeah, it should be. Uh, but one death is more than enough. Oh, I, I agree with you on that. It's just that. I, I felt that because we were using that as a, as a selling point for the project, we might want to clarify that. I, I know I'm not aware of anybody being struck by it. Right. It is a, one of the criteria that you set for maintenance and operation. Just out of my curiosity. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions? So, uh, are you aware of if some of these properties, in addition to the Conservation Futures uh, acquisition, are they uh, participating in the PBRS? program. I don't know if that was part of it. Uh, a lot of the, our farmlands that are um, in existing ag open space, um, I think only one has part of the property in PBRS and the other in open space ag. But I'd have to look. Yeah, that, that, uh, <coughs> I, I appreciate the, the application and the the way that you identified the conservation futures projects, my my point is that I think it's been a, 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 a high priority whenever this board has uh, discussed that public benefit rating system to increase public access uh, on, on farmland. I, I, um, and I, so this helps fulfill that though through the conservation futures pro program. 
Um, I also wanted to ask about risk management on trail easements. If um, we could talk about having the public cross private property and how, how, uh, how maybe it would be a two-part response, but Pat, if you address that question first. Just have, what's the liability for folks? So on all of the conservation easements, um, the land trust is the holder that has the affirmative right to uh, construct and maintain and operate the trail easements. As part of our conservation easement and that affirmative right, the land trust or its assigns or designees, I'm gonna read from our language, it's legal language, shall hold harmless, indemnify, and defend the property owners from any and all liabilities, penalties, costs, losses, damages, expenses, causes of action, claims, demands, or judgments, including without limitation, reasonable attorneys and consultant fees arising from or in any way connected with injury or death of any person or physical damage to any property resulting from any act, omission, condition, or other matter related to or arising out of the construction, operation, maintenance, or use of the trail that is not a consequence of any action or omission by the landowner. That is a huge thing for the land trust to do. We have uh, quite a bit of insurance. Uh, we also hold legal defense insurance on every property and conservation easements that we have, uh, which will bring in experts from around the country to uh, defend that ease the, the lawsuit. And we also have a rather robust legal defense fund, all designed to ensure perpetuity, but more importantly, to help make sure that the private property owners who where we hold private property rights on, on those um, are protected. Thank you. Elaine, did you have anything uh, to speak about uh, as our risk manager? As your risk manager, uh, we work closely with the land trust to uh, negotiate uh, liability language within any easement or contract that we have with the land trust so that the county is protected in case of an unfortunate incident. And there is state law around private uh, landowners you, uh, opening their property to public use. Uh, I believe so, but they do treat, uh, the law treats local governments differently. Thank you for addressing that. Uh, I just, uh, and actually I, I just wanted to clarify or make a point that uh, in our May 10th work session, I had raised the question about the funding or, or how much the total cost of the project would be. Um, I was, because I asked that question in the work session, you, you responded to where the Land Land Trust has responded, and I thank you for the response and it clarifies a lot for me, but if you could quickly explain to the public who's here, um, that there are other funds being used, and et cetera, and that this is actually just paying for the plan and the initial construction, but there's other phases coming, and you're going to be leveraging other funds. It is my understanding to help with that. Uh, yes, um, I, I'm sorry, I thought I addressed that in my presentation, but as I said, uh, there, ten thousand dollars is just the start of being able to do the first phase of the trail easement. Um, the application ch states that we want to do 1.5 miles. We actually uh, are intending to do 3.4 miles to connect our Admiralty Inlet Preserve all the way over to Rhododendron Park and the Rhodey Trail. Um, so we will be bringing, as we always do, additional funds and volunteer help to make that pro to uh, complete that project. Right, and I, I appreciate it. it was a very detailed uh, explanation in, in regards to my question. But I just that was one of the things I wanted clarified um, to um, gain my support, and you did, well, did very well on that. Thank you. Thank you. When you mentioned that there was uh, multiple funders for these easements, one of the funding sources was federal funding. Is that sourced through RCO grants? Was the source through REPI funds? What is the what was the federal source? There were the primary source were U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service National Coastal Wetlands grant money. 
also uh, endangered federal endangered species money, um, natural resources concert, uh, conservation service, farmland uh, monies, and a small amount of Navy money that was not REPI. And what was the intention of the Navy partnership? Do you know? Uh, the Navy, when we work with the Navy, it's when our conservation priorities are uh, overlap with their priorities, which are completely different. And so when we do conservation easements, as directed under the EV's Landing National Historical Reserve, the idea is to remove development rights uh, so that the reserve remains pastoral um, with that historic connection. Removing development rights is also of um, interest to the Navy. Because of their concerns about encroachment? Uh, I think there are multiple reasons. I... Are there any other questions? Just, uh, not for Pat, but uh, for staff with, with the land at risk. Um, but what actually Pat would go through this. So, so there's been a lot of uh, um, discussion around possible noise impacts in this area. So when it comes to risk management, if somebody was to come back five years from now, these trails being completed, somebody comes back five years from now and says that noise from the Navy jets is making them ill or something, is there any way to be held liable for that? We've got the trail system there. Knowing that the Navy, that is a Naval flight area and that that is probably not going to uh, change anytime soon. Uh, something like that is always possible. It depends on uh, the nature of the claim that's filed and uh, the uh, damages that uh, they're seeking, but it is possible for sure. Well, I just, uh, and to make it clear, I have, I. I seriously doubt that there would be any viable claim like that come through simply because I don't think it's possible. I, I think, think that's what the real owners thought. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, thank you. I was just curious. It would be part of, in other words, it'd be a stretch for them to do it? It could be. Uh, there are ways that the county can mitigate uh, such claims. Uh, However, I think they'd be very impractical to require everybody that walked on the trail to sign a release. Yeah, but just the fact that the property or the development rights have been sold due to encroachment yeah, to would mean that there's an acknowledgement of that. I, I don't have a question. I, I really have a clarification about um, changing criteria. But, it's really to my fellow board members, so I'll, I'll hold that for right now. You're welcome to ask it if you'd like to. Well, we, we spent over a year going through the, the process of creating a uh, <coughs> selection criteria, and I, I think that when you take a look at this application in view of the evaluation elements that we had uh, agreed to, in the, um, those the, it scores very well. And so, um, that there's been some additional uh, requests uh, for for clarification um, and a, a different level of scrutiny for this is a is a concern to me. So I just wanted to uh, make sure that uh, I I wanted to be clear. I was using the the criteria that we had worked together as a board uh, in evaluating the projects. So would you prefer that? We not have a public hearing and the commissioners not exercise their decision-making authority and just have everything immediately approved based on criteria and not look at each individual application outside of those criteria? I think, I think we should. I, I think the public process is a really important one. I think that if what we want is for folks to have additional criteria, I would like that to be made known at the time of application. I think there, we, we spent quite a bit of time talking about how important it was that this process be transparent and predictable. And, um, and I really, I, I trusted that that was how we'd come together. I, I felt that that was all in good faith. And, um, and I, I understand that there are questions and concerns that can be brought forward, but there was actually additional criteria that were put out that made a different level of uh, criteria for selection or 
um, on, on this one project and I, I that that was a concern for me so I so I, mean, I listened earlier to the comment about public trust and I knew that that comment was related directly to the statements about transparency I think it's difficult to put additional questions out there before receiving an application because you don't know what your additional questions are until you've read the application so in this instance the application came through based on our initial criteria it was posted on a work session agenda that we were going to be discussing it it was the first opportunity for the board to discuss it in public because as the public knows we don't discuss things in private at that meeting uh, pa pal was there and i said here are some conditions for my support i did not say they were conditions for the board support i said they are conditions for my support i said it out loud in a public meeting i said it to the applicant prior to this meeting so that i didn't have any surprises when the, when the applicant got here and i had reasons for asking these questions so I, what i'm trying to clarify is if what we're doing is saying if an application checks the boxes then we don't need to have the commissioners vote on it at all because we're not allowing our uh, an opportunity for us to review and have additional questions on behalf of the community and look at things from multiple perspectives. If that's a decision the board wants to make, then we can just do a scoring process on MNOs. But we've designed a process where the board can use its individual thought process and apply that to a grant application and ask further questions if they need clarification. I, I kind of thought that was my job I, I think I think asking questions is one thing I think changing criteria is something different that's that that's how I am viewing what happened I, I and understand I, that. a letter went out on behalf of the board of directors that's untrue that's actually untrue uh, actually a, an email was sent from staff saying the board because a majority of the board I, I signed things on behalf of the board that the two of you agree so a, a, a majority right. of the board asked for further clarification on issues that was a, a letter from the board of county commissioners it was a staff follow-up to the things that were discussed publicly in front of the applicant so it was a very it, this was on a published agenda we yes. discussed it at our work session in public I agree. and so what i'm concerned about is this statements that are being made that this is a non-transparent process when in fact in this particular instance i did exactly what i was supposed to do and not wait till the 11th hour to spring something on people and use that public process to express my concerns the applicant had ample, ample time to follow up with me yes. if they chose to i mean there weren't any secrets and so the, the i don't mind different of, of opinion i do have some concerns with the comment about public transparency and public trust because in fact our process was followed to a T it was followed to a T you, you have every, you had every right to do what happened it's, except except for the part about changing the criteria at the not, last minute it's not a change in criteria to ask for further clarification it's that in, in my comments earlier and now I, that's I, I thought that we had decided on a process that included a public hearing and included uh, uh, a chance for folks to clarify and answer questions on behalf of the board. The, the uh, letters from uh, health officials and outside entities was not part of that criteria for any any other conservation futures projects. And so that that was where I that that's the difference. Because the other conservation futures projects were not in this particular area of possible incompatible use. So the question didn't arise on a, on a bar point application. It's not going to arise on a park state, uh, county park conversation if the parks aren't within this area. And just for further note, I also voted no on the Kettles Net Trail extension four years ago because I have a very consistent belief that public infrastructure in a in a incompatible area around the, the, the flight zone is something to be concerned about. So not only is this consistent with things I've said in the past it was transparent it was well communicated and the goal was not to trip anybody up the goal was to go back to applicants who have people entities that are a stakeholder in this process and say to them hey you've expressed major concerns about this in terms of being outside and jet noise and are you confident enough to say it's safe to put the public out there it's different for a private individual to make a choice this is a choice on behalf of all citizens who aren't necessarily being educated about what they may or may not be exposed to 
the groups that were asked to clarify were stakeholders in that particular process. So Island County, the health officer spoke. National Parks spoke. Uh, Evie's Reserve has spoke. And I wanted some documentation from the land trust to say that they were aware of all the concern and that they felt that they didn't rise to a level of concern for their own protection so that we could see what their, me what their mentality was at the time of application. It's intended to be protective and serving of our community. And I, I, I can't help how it was interpreted as additional criteria, but that is not what it was. It was clarifying information. So, and and that's our job. And that's why we have a public process, and that's why things aren't automatically approved, in my opinion. And, and I, I understand that you and I might see this differently, and I appreciate the extra effort that was put into this application and the, all the different entities that weighed in. Um, and I'm looking forward to the public comment. Uh, yeah, just uh, anybody that did not listen to the comments of the May 10th meeting, um, it's a pity because it was, I think some of it was taken out of context. However, the question I had in particular at the end of that meeting was answered by the Whidbey Command of Land Trust. And I think it was a valid question because I asked that of just about every application that comes through on anything is where's the rest of the money coming from, whether it's conservation futures, down to porta potties, and, and things involving road funds. Um, so it's not always in, in related to grant monies. So I like to know when numbers add up. And I appreciate, Pat, your, um, your, your fulfilling that request. Um, and to be honest with you, I never said I was against this trail project. Actually, I kind of like it because it's connecting existing things. I just had concerns. I also had concerns involving risk management because we have been peppered with meetings for the past 16 months anyway where, where certain groups have come forward and, and um, protested in a manner that said that they, they, there was a health hazard. And I'm just looking at things from a risk management point of view. Um, is the letters or the clarification that was given back to us in response to um, Commissioner Johnson's request, I think fulfill things. Um, I've received no correspondence via email from anybody saying that they're concerned about noise. Um, I find that um, very, very interesting. Everybody wants the trail. Nobody has expressed a concern about noise, especially from the groups and individuals that are particularly vociferous in that matter. So as far as I'm concerned, I am going to take a no response or that silence as um, those individuals that argue that it's not safe to be out there. I'm going to take that as their consent that it is safe. I'm going to imply it. So with that... I have a question on timing. So uh, we understand that we'll get a final EIS this fall that will talk about the intensity of the plane usage that will be out there. Is this a project that can hold until after we get that information, or is it a project that needs to be acted on this year? It's at your discretion. There's nothing time sensitive that would require us to act now, other than hope. I'd, I would prefer that it be now. We are planning next year to bring in the FACMA Farm Trail easement, and we only have a very small number of staff. This is on our work plan and funded for this year. Um, so we'll start backing up other projects. But no other funding tied to it that's at risk. We have volunteers ready to go and some donations that are ready to match. And, and in reality, the majority of this request is for planning. So if you were doing your planning and something came in, say the EIS was contrary to it or, or whatever, that, you know, threw a, threw a monkey wrench in it, that could be included into the plan. The planning is going to take quite a while. Um, and probably that means the construction, by the time we get our contract, if you approve this, it, you know, it'll be next year, and we'll have to wait for the wet weather to um, dry out. We might, we might want to consider um, having this be a two-year grant with the construction in the following year, so that it would be after the EIS was completed. That, well, 
That's what I'm thinking because currently we're nine thousand dollars in the hole. So if we did it a two year grant, forty this year, ten next year. We can think about that. That's just an idea to kick around. Any more questions for our applicant or staff? Okay, Pat, you're off the hook for a while. Thank you. We might see Thanks. you back up here. <laughs> Thank you, Pat. I know it was. Uh, at this time, because it's not a public hearing, and I got myself squared away, uh, what I'm going to do is try, just, you can come up as you're ready, and I'll just check you off the list as you come up, and then I'll try to make sure I didn't miss anybody on the list so we don't have to go through the awkward process <coughs> we did last time. Although I will say that Linda Wehrman, you might want to kick us off because you are first actually on the list. If you don't mind, get us That's going. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so I am Linda Wehrman from Coopville, and I want to thank everybody who's worked obviously very hard on this project, including the board. Uh, th and thank you for the opportunity to speak about your consideration of this trail expansion and what we probably all agree must be one of the most spectacular places on the whole earth. It's obviously a very heated topic. My comments today are focused around the value of respect. The golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It is a big piece of what's been missing in our lives lately, from the very top in Washington, D.C., all the way down to our beautiful Whidbey Island. I have attended a few county meetings, but I missed the work session that was last month when the proposal in question was made. It is my understanding that discussion and decision were made at a time when Commissioner Helen Price Johnson was not able to participate fully, and she was completely unaware of the action that we're all questioning. It was obvious that Commissioners Jill and Rick did not bother to discuss uh, your discussion with her before, during, or after the meeting nor did you speak with her about her interview in the Whitby News Times uh, from June 3rd that you had issue with. Instead, uh, last week, uh, Commissioner Hanold ambushed her at the meeting, it felt like to me, interrupted her multiple times while she tried to discuss the article. I was there, it was very uncomfortable. I watched, again, I watched portions of the video on the Island County webpage over the weekend, and Rick, I invite you to look at that again and see how it went. To me, it felt uh, it was a perfect example of disrespectfulness. Even when you don't agree with us, we still need you to respect us. When you aren't respectful of people's reasonable fears of a very large proposed increase of touch and goes at OLF and the noise related to that, or the disrespect the fears people have of their water quality, you aren't doing your job. I would say, I like to say respectfully, that I do respect all that you do and the important role that you play in decisions you make that affect my life and the lives of my neighbors. I also respect the Navy, even though they don't always try as hard to be good neighbors as I would like. And I respect the men and women and their families that are a part of that. They make sacrifices for all of us. As for me, personally, I use the trail system in the area three or five times a week. Uh, and when the trail building began, sign me up to be a volunteer. I'd be very excited about that. I see tourists along with their income also using it every time I go there. I think the proposal in question was poorly handled. It does not feel like true concern for anyone's health or liability or finances. It feels like vindictiveness to me. You being elected officials and people with power over others are held to a higher standard of respect toward others. When you talk about slapping people back, you, as you have in the past, you are not performing the duties we, you were elected to do. So I would ask for more respect from each of you, for one another, and for us. We should be able to voice our concerns without fear of retaliation. And we need to know you have our backs, and that you are being objective and consider all sides when you are making your decisions. And P.S. I have walked along that 55 mile per hour stretch, um, and it is pretty scary. And it'd be just a matter of time before someone is hurt. But anyway, please take all this into your consideration when you're deliberating. And I thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. I'll go next. Let's just get this over with. Sorry, Sheriff. 
Joe Kunzler here. Um, I, my comments are strictly about the uh, grant application. I do have a question through the chair to staff and to county commissioners. That question begins with, should taxpayers via grants encourage more trails for folks to get close to OLF who are not there to engage in aviation tourism or enjoy OLF? That is a direct quote of a question I've put on the Whitby News Times comment threads because frankly, I don't think I'm very smart. And I don't know the answer to that question. And I don't think I'm very smart. And in the news, what is what? I mean, we have on YouTube and audio, Lisa Masserol, whose name is on the applicants of this thing, saying from 19 April 2016, Lisa, quote, lived on Fort Casey Road directly under the flight path, end quote, and had a, quote, significant problem, end quote, and had to, quote, leave the property if possible, end quote, during Grower flights. So I don't see why this trail makes sense now. I just don't see it. Maybe I'm stupid. Maybe one of these cores has a PhD in intelligence that I lack. I mean, we have Ken Picard on the core Facebook page saying, quote, they bring punishing toxic noise and poison to our water, this most beautiful area on earth destroyed by noise and poison. Mr. Picard is an applicant for this grant. The same Mr. Picard who said that the 19 April 2016 Island County Board of Health, quote, in my opinion, and I don't say this lightly, as I've practiced personal injury litigation for 32 years, plaintiff's side, in my opinion, you're grossly negligent in addressing the single biggest hazard in Island County, and that's toxic jet noise, end quote. So it's Bill and her trail around his property and now Jan McCarty is Senator for this thing's five jet noise traumatic and went to a federal judge and said, kill our troops, what shut down all left. I think Palmer is probably better. Okay. Yeah, Palmer. But you know, when you file declarations in federal court and say, kill our troops to close OLF, you gotta pay the price for that. That's why I'm against this trail. Okay, and your time's up and Palmer is better. Okay, okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Anne, Casey, did you want to, you didn't want to talk again. Okay, I'm just trying to encourage people to step up. Laura Taylor? I should stay under my five minutes, three minutes, but I have my iPhone timer on here. So, it appears to me that there's a disagreement between some members of the board, the Board of Health, the public, different members of the public, the Navy, about noise. So let's, I'm looking at taking this proposal and taking noise out of it and looking at things that we do agree upon. Uh, the Department of Defense and Island County both agree on accident potential zones. Now we don't know whether this trail is going to end up in an accident potential zone. We won't know until the AQ study is completed, which is after the decision of record is made. But when that happens, we do, we do know what the Island County Code currently says. And trails are not prohibited in either APZ1 or APZ2. Trails are a transient use. What's prohibited in those accident potential zones is places where people will congregate and spend large amounts of time in one place, like a, like a campground or a homeless shelter or a transit center. So in any case, this proposal doesn't uh, conflict with Island County's current codes regarding to risk with uh, shared use of military operations and public uses. I hear the concerns about should we be putting tax dollars toward this. Again, I would refer you to the accident potential zones when they're drawn and the tax implications of those takings and the property loss that will happen when people can no longer develop their property in ways that are incompatible with military operations. In the city of Oceana, which is one of the cities we should be looking at to look at how they handled it, they've already spent $129 million over, I believe, a seven to 10 year period. This cost split between the city of Oceana and the state of Virginia, none of which are borne by the Navy. So when we're looking at how we're gonna shepherd our tax dollars and how we're going to balance military operations and, and land use, I think that's where we need to be focusing our energy. This trail project certainly doesn't conflict with current uh, Island County legislation about safety and compatible land use. And, and I would just offer that for anyone here today, Coopville Community Allies has an a a APZ fact sheet. If you'd like to get a copy of it from me, and it's going to be released on our webpage uh, later this week at Coopville Community Allies Supper. And I have 45 seconds that I will give up. Thanks.
Harry, this is your time. Yes, it is. Harry Tulga, Coopville. So last week's front, pra front page, Whitby News Times, uh, Island Trail gains traction. County Board doing all kinds of community meetings to get input on this. This is a good thing. This is a snapshot of the future of Whidbey Island. Improve outdoor recreation and healthy lifestyles in Al Island County. That's what your funds that you're holding up, that's what you're supposed to do with them. Your decision to hold them is a bad decision. Uh, my other question simply is, with this corridor trail from bridge to boat, do you require the same loyalty pledges about noise from those people as you do from this little routine here locally? I think I know the answer. Anybody else? Uh, yes, Garrett Newkirk, uh, an Island County resident. Uh, I think it is unconscionable that you would go outside of your rating system that you're using and bringing in a new set of regulations to judge each individual uh, applicant, which is disconcerting that you're changing it at the end point instead of doing it at the very beginning of the process. Uh, as several of the other folks have said, uh, of course, uh, we on the north end already have APZ zones and AQs. Um, that you currently, for some reason, you know, you say that they're not compatible, whichever, and of course that they're dangerous, that the Navy doesn't want them in those areas, late our trails or any other tourism type stuff, you have Deception Pass. We better close that down as well, which is going to be a, a pretty much going to happen probably, because they're already losing money and tourism from that from the noise. Uh, you're also running a marathon right through APZ-1. If you're not aware, that Oak Harbor does that illegally. So you should be stepping in and stopping those things from happening. Because we already have those APZ zonings and those AQs. We on the north end have gotten zero compensation from this. And basically you're killing the actual lifeblood of this island, which is farming you are actually killing it because people aren't coming to our farm anymore because of the noise. They used to stay over in Anacortes. They don't stay there anymore to come. They were staying at uh, Deception Pass to begin with. They moved to Anacortes. They moved to Mount Vernon. And they can still hear the noise. And with this, you're changing the rating system at the end instead of at the beginning. Uh, it should be done on their merit alone and what the public benefit is from it instead of you bringing something in at the end of this and wait and now you're going to wait until the end of the EIS which is what are you going to do if the Navy is like they've done in post fashion have not completed their EIS and just kick it down the road because they're going to bring in a new aircraft which would be the F-35 and not finish this think about that because it's going to be a long time and a lot louder. Thank you. Next. Hi, Gretchen Luxemburg, Freeland, Washington. I'm commenting today in support of the Conservation Futures Funding for the Walking Nebis Initiative. The island population continues to grow, and both islanders and visitors alike want and are demanding more public access to the shoreline, forests, and the meadows, wetlands, and farmlands that comprise the beauty of Island County. Access can be both physical and visual. We need both. We count on and need those scenic vistas as we travel throughout the county. We also need the physical access, and this means trails. This demand will not go away. More and more people are getting out on these trails and they're being used. Over 800 people visited the Jacob Beebe House and Bluff Trail over Memorial Day weekend alone. And the existing trails cannot handle this kind of load. People need to be dispersed. We have an outstanding opportunity to support the work of an organization that is making every islander's quality of life better through their purchase of easements on resource lands throughout the county. The county has a vision to connect the bridge to the boat and get residents and visitors off the main roads for both enjoyment and safety. This land trust project, Walking E Peace, is an important piece of that vision and would serve to connect existing trails to one another, thus extending the overall trail system the county currently has. 
The land trust is standing ready to help the county by undertaking this project. They're ready to initiate the planning that is needed prior to construction and then implement the first stage of trail construction. The county will look great and be meeting its mission and goals to provide recreational opportunities for its residents. <coughs> residents and visitors will be happy as they will have more choices for walking. It will alleviate pressure off other heavily used trails and the funding for the project, Conservation Futures, is exactly why these tax dollars are collected. The voters want these trails, they want choices, and they want the trails connected. It will not only make a difference for these folks out for recreation, but also for our business community, which stands to benefit from increased sales of food, gas, and other products, particularly to visitors to the island. The Land Trust has been around for over two decades now and has a long and success successful track record of planning, funding and implementing land protection for the enjoyment of us all. They take care of what they've been given and monitor that which they've purchased for protection. They will make every dollar count and leverage those funds for additional funding, thus expanding what you are getting for each dollar you pass along to the land trust. This is a great deal with a reputable organization. Please do not let this opportunity pass by. This will be part of your legacy to the voters of this county whom you represent. Support this project by approving Conservation Futures funding for the Land Trust and get the walking EB's initiative underway to con connect our trails. Thank you. is a remarkable treasure for the whole world, not just for us. Walk through the reserve sometime and just ask people at random what they think of this place when they're out walking on the bluff trail or down on the beach. So many times you run into people from other countries that say, this reminds me of where I grew up in the Netherlands or in Norway. I mean, it's truly a remarkable place. And we are so lucky to be here and to be the stewards of this place. Um, I worked for the Whitby Command Land Trust as, on the board and as a volunteer for years, and I worked for the NPS, National Park Service, for about 27 years. I found both to be honorable organizations that are non-political, resource protection oriented, committed to public recreation, and, a, and an enjoyment of public lands by the public. The pieces for this project are all in place. Very nice presentation. I know the Land Trust does its homework. This is a, re a reliable outfit that will spend the money wisely and leverage it. Um, I think it's a perfect fit for both the National Park Service vision and the public's wishes. And I will be a volunteer out there with my grub ball. Just tell me where to start digging. It uh, hypocritical of at least two of the members of the commission who have uh, basically ignored all comments, questions, concerns about noise in Central Whitby from citizens who have come here for about a year and a half or two years. And to use that as the basis of your argument to deny this really great project that the Navy has supported with their own funds seems completely hypocritical to me. Totally off the edge, off the mark of what you are responsible and should be doing. The other thing that I find really extraordinary about what's happening here is that to ask other public officials and staff to discuss uh, noise, uh, to say that noise is not an issue, uh, and basically this is called extortion, and extortion is not allowed by public officials. It's just not allowed. You can't do this. You can't have a democratic society, a democratic culture, without allowing people to have their own personal opinions. You can't ask staff to support your own opinions because they're afraid they might not 
have a job tomorrow. So I just want to, to know that we are investigating kind of how this resolution came down. We're really concerned that Helen Price Johnson was not in the room when all this happened. That's a, that's a concern, and I know that there have been some past decisions that have been made because we have FOIA information where two of the commissioners have had conversations without the third commissioner. So we're investigating this, and um, we will be monitoring the situation. So thank you, and it's a good project. Can I clarify? I think you might want to. The, 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 the discussion did happen at a scheduled open public meeting. Yes. I, I don't dispute that. It, it was it, the, the setting of the public meeting today was, was the item on the agenda. Yes. What, what wasn't clear to me was that there was going to be a change in the criteria or yes. that there was going to be a communication on behalf of the board that went out uh, and I wasn't aware of the communicate of the nature of the communication that was going out to the community. And right, I that is heard that about is, it from a community member. So that, that is what I was referring there, to. There was nothing nefarious about the process that was followed as far as Open Public Meetings Act. I just want to make sure that that's very clear. No, I understand that, but the same situation has happened in other I, occasions. I'm not, I'm not okay. going to speak to it. This situation was in compliance with the Open Public Meetings Act. Our Correct. agendas are published agendas, and if a commissioner isn't at the table and they miss a public agenda, then the conversation continues on without them. There have been things that have happened in my district. In fact, an enforcement order happened in my district at a meeting that I was not able to attend, and the remaining board took action, and the majority of the board agreed. That is what happens when you're not at the table. Thank, thank you. I just, want to I, just, I just wanted a clarification. There, you know, it's just that there is an appearance that commissioners, a couple of commissioners acted without the uh, knowledge of the other commissioner. And I don't think that is a good situation for us to condone. And what we're telling you right now is that there may be an appearance, but there is not a reality of that. That one commissioner was not at the table at a pu on a published agenda and was not able to participate in the conversation. We speak to each other in public. That's how we do it. Right. So, so well, I, I do know of occasions where you've canceled a meeting but without another commissioner knowing. What? what? Uh, you, you've canceled meetings without other people who are on that board knowing. I mean, well, there, there have been other occasions. That's why well, there is a okay, concern. So I just want to clear up the ethics question and the transparency question. That this board takes open public meetings very seriously. We publish our agenda. We meet in public regardless of how awkward and difficult that is for us because let me assure you we would much prefer to do things out behind the scenes. I'm and not challenging the public agenda. So what I want to make clear is that there was no unethical behavior by this board in this process. There is a disagreement of where we are at but the process itself was ethical, the staff behaved ethically, and the board behaved ethically. And, and if there is a community misperception because two commissioners agree, I think that maybe you need to go look back in time when Commissioner Price Johnson and I agreed on issues and Commissioner Emerson didn't. You didn't accuse us of colluding. Sometimes two agree. Sometimes two don't agree. That's, that's how it works. But it doesn't mean it's unethical or nefarious or hidden. And, I, and I, I hope we have that clear. Commissioner Price Johnson spoke to the fact that it was not done unethically. I've spoken to it, Commissioner Hamill's spoken to it. We've told you that it was not done unethically. And so I'm open to hearing other comments, certainly all of your comments, but to be clear, to continue to accuse us of non-transparent behavior is doing a disservice to the entire community. Just, just to make an example, Tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. there's a scheduled public meeting for a work session. I will not be present. Okay, I have another appointment between 9 and 10. The meeting will go on and any decision or any action taken in that meeting is perfectly legal. In the regards to people saying how we bring things forward that haven't been talked about before we bring them forward at a meeting, uh, Ms. Uh, let me see, Linda, we are not allowed to talk among ourselves in private. It has to be in a public meeting. Two people makes it a public meeting. There seems to be some perception out here in the public that Commissioner 
Johnson and myself denied this grant. We did not deny. So what I want to make clear is that there was no unethical behavior by this board in this process. There is a disagreement of where we are at, but the process itself was ethical. The staff behaved ethically and the board behaved ethically. And, and if there is a community misperception because two commissioners agree, I think that maybe you need to go look back in time when Commissioner Price Johnson and I agreed on issues and Commissioner Emerson didn't. You didn't accuse us of colluding. Sometimes two agree. Sometimes two don't agree. That's, that's how it works. But it doesn't mean it's unethical or nefarious or hidden. And I, and I, I hope we have that clear. Commissioner Price Johnson spoke to the fact that it was not <coughs> done unethically. I've spoken to it. Commissioner Hamill's spoken to it. We've told you that it was not done unethically. And so I'm open to hearing other comments, certainly all your comments, but to be clear, to continue to accuse us of non-transparent behavior is doing a disservice to the entire community. Just, just to make an example, tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. there's a scheduled public meeting for a work session. I will not be present. Okay, I have another appointment between 9 and 10. The meeting will go on, and any decision or any action taken in that meeting is perfectly legal. In the regards to people saying how we bring things forward that haven't been talked about before we bring them forward at a meeting, uh, Ms. Uh, uh, let's see, Linda, we are not allowed to talk among ourselves in private. It has to be in a public meeting. Two people makes it a public meeting. There seems to be some perception out here in the public that Commissioner Johnson and myself denied this grant. We did not deny any grant. That is why we're here today. This is the process. We talked about it in work session. We asked for additional information. Pat Powell and her staff at Whidbey Kamena Land Trust have provided that information. We are going forward right this moment with the public hearing where a decision will now be made. So whatever you read in papers, whatever you read on Facebook, whatever you had perhaps in conversations is a misperception. The decision is being made right now. It wasn't made May 10th. We asked for additional information, and it was provided. Thank you. All right. So I'm failing in chairmanship because we're supposed to listen silently, but hopefully we got the ethics question cleared up. And then maybe somebody else wants to come forward. Uh, Peg, did you want? Oh, yeah, sir. Okay. Uh, my name is Larry Barrett, sometimes known as Lori. Um, I mean, <laughs> nothing personal. Um, I live here in Coopville. I'm speaking here um, in a representative capacity as the uh, founder and uh, co-leader of Indivisible Whitby. Indivisible is a nationwide um, organization of about 7,000 uh, grassroots groups across the country uh, formed um, in reaction to uh, the election of our 45th president. Um, our focus is normally on national issues, so congratulations, commissioners, you have attracted our attention this morning. Um, I'm here um, really um, at, the, at, um, at the request of a number of my members um, speaking about my concern about the link the commissioners have made between this extension of a trail system and concerns over the expansion of OLF. Um, our members have varying <laughs> positions on that expansion, but we certainly support um, the ability of all of our members to speak their minds um, and to exercise their First Amendment rights with respect to that expansion. I'm here because it's unclear to me, it was certainly unclear to me when I walked in, whether that concern was a legitimate concern expressed by uh, by you, Commissioner Jill Johnson, and you, Commissioner Rick Cannell, over the public health, uh, the possible danger of the noise um, you know, to people hiking in the trails, or whether the concern really was over the political activism 
around that expansion, and was it an effort to try to discourage that conversation? We are deeply concerned um, that you've left the impression, that impression may be real, that you are placing a link between the receipt of the citizens of Coopville in this region of normal county services and county funding and the free speech um, of our members and other members of our community and for that matter of our elected officials over what's going on in OLS. <coughs> if you would like at some point to try to erase the fact that that connection has been made in the public mind, in the press, and by my attending here in my mind as well, I would welcome you doing that. Thank you very much. impressed by the eloquence of those who have spoken before me. They've certainly covered pretty much all of the issues that I was going to talk about. As far as noise issues are concerned, I would like to differentiate between residents who are in their houses when these jets come screaming overhead and visitors who have a choice as to where they're going to be when. People who are hiking the trail may choose not to do so when the growlers are flying. People who live in their houses are kind of stuck. Um, I'd like to point out that technology may in fact solve that entire jet problem in that what I have been seeing, hearing, and reading is that the Navy is talking about performing the functions which growlers presently do with uh, drones and that, that that may be the next step so that the assumption that the growlers will always be there and the noise will always be there. No. Growlers come, growlers go. The prairie will be there hopefully for the next 10 or 20 millennia. Um, and as has been pointed out, this the, the trail system protects both the prairie and the open space by uh, reducing uh, development potential. So win-win for Navy and the rest of us who really love the prairie as it is. Um, it's also been pointed out that uh, with the Camino Land Trust um, leverages funding from Conservation Futures, which is often the very smallest part of a very much larger significant package, and that's the case in this case as well. Uh, with the Camino Land Trust, does a dynamite job, and with the Environmental Action Network, supports them wholeheartedly in this, and I hope that you will as well. Thank you. Steve. Steve Erickson, for the third time today. So I'll speak for with the Environmental Action. Uh, some years ago, the Conservation Futures Program underwent some major changes um, consideration. Uh, and part of that was that it was pretty explicitly decided that what, the information that was needed for an application was what was on the application, pretty much. And that patently was not the case here. Uh, you can try to parse it as you will, but the reality is that additional criteria were added to the application for would be Camino Land Trust after, you know, really at the tail end of the process. Those were not questions. When you say, you have to get letters from these entities saying such and such, that's an application requirement. That's a requirement. That's not just, uh, we want a little more information. Um, and given what's gone before, I don't see how any reasonable person could not draw the conclusion that it was political payback. It was political payback to the people of Central Whidbey who are concerned, rightfully so, about the jet noise. It was political pay, pay, payback to Coopville and the Coopville elected officials, especially in person of Pat Powell as executive director of the Land Trust. 
Uh, and Rick, you even made statements that were quoted in the press before to that effect that that was going to be in the back of your mind. Well, I, you know, the appearance is certainly that it came to the front of your mind here. And I really think in doing this, you have failed your duties as elected officials. Uh, you have taken powers unto yourselves that are not yours to take. And you are really trampling on some really basic constitutional rights and freedoms of the people for free speech and for dissent, and to petition government for redress of grievances. And I think you should think about that. I changed my mind probably a dozen times whether to say anything today, and a lot of people before me will say it better than I will. Jerry, and I do not want to, I'm sorry, and my name is Jerry Lloyd of Green Bank. Um, I, I want to be careful that I don't talk too much about me and be perceived as Trump-ish, but I think my background is uh, possibly of interest. Um, I spent some years in the Navy as an air traffic controller working at places like OLF. We're hearing, hearing aids because of that. Um, I also got interested in aviation, possibly as a commercial career, and I really, really enjoyed that particular part of my life. But then I chose to move on and um, come out west, went to Seattle, attended the University of Washington. I obtained a degree in environmental health, which I basically never really used. But I did learn in that the degree process the science behind the risk of noise exposure, which I find interesting to this discussion. After that, um, I, I got into the corporate world where I was really, really lucky. I worked in the sales and marketing part of a large manufacturing company, had some ownership, and we were basically making products for trail users all over the world. And they paid me good enough, well enough that I could afford to retire here and enjoy quite an amazing life. And during those 30 years in the outdoor industry, it became very clear that the access to trails were both an economic benefit to the local communities and a big mental and physical benefit to the trail users. In retirement, I have stayed active in the trail community by helping with things like the Trillium Community Forest, working with the Land Trust, which I dearly love, and I'm a land steward there. Also serving currently on the board of the Friends of the John Wayne Trail Organization to support the longest cross-state cross -state trail in the U.S. So I'm a trail head case. That's been established. In addition to my life of being interested in trails, I've continued my interest in aviation, and thanks to my wife buying me some flying lessons last birthday, I did a reboot on my flying activities. I started flying again and even purchased an airplane recently, and which will bring that point back up in a second. So I think it's very clear that I have a solid interest in both aviation and trails. And so to get to my point, it really upset me when two of our elected officials attempted to play one of my interests against the other. I'm not going to continue with the rest of my comments because I'm afraid I'll upset two of the commissioners. I'm just going to close with a request, please vote for this. Please. And then when we're done with this, would you come down to the Whitby Airport and drive Crawford Road and look at all the economic activity potential there and make it easier for me to get to my airplane because I don't want to have to drive my truck the rest of my life to get to my airplane. Thank you. My name is Linda Good, and I'm a music teacher on South Whidbey, and I'm really concerned about noise, as you can imagine. And I, I was, I'm also a musician who's performed. We performed at the amphitheater at 
Deception Park where the growlers were going over the plains and we had to stop every few seconds and wait till they went over before we could continue our music. And also, our, our, we were camping there with our grandchildren and noise like that is obviously worse for children than it is for adults. And I also want to say I have a student who has a house right near the, the path, the flight path, and he's lost a lot of his hearing. He has hearing aids, but hearing is especially hard for musicians, so please consider the hearing issue when you're um, voting on these things. Thanks. Because this is another one of those misperceptions, okay? You know, there's been a lot of talk in the press, and there was a certain statement that I made that was printed in the press, but what led up to that statement was not put in the press, the conversation I had with a would-be News Times reporter. And during that conversation, there was uh, uh, mentions about some things that were done. And, and uh, in regards to the EIS and positions and stands that people on the county uh, or the city, excuse me, the town council and the mayor had said. And Pat Powell's name came up individually and, and the, the question was put to me, but she's on the would-be Commando Plan Crust and she was on the town council. And so if, a, if one of these requests comes up or something like that, is that going to be a part of this? And my response to her was, well, I'd be a liar to say that this wouldn't be in the back of my mind. And that it goes with any kind of dealings I have, because what was what happened during that time was we found out that there was a difference in opinions and a difference in stands on a particular uh, um, item that we were working on. That's perfectly well and good. But if I'm sitting back and I'm doing business with somebody and I know that their interests are contrary to the ones that I have, that is going to remain in the back of my mind. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry if I speak. But you know what? I could have sat there and told the reporter, oh, no, no, I would never think of that. And it would have been a blatant lie. So excuse me for being truthful. You're okay. But I'm sitting here, and you sat here, and you've listened to the way I've treated Pat Powell in this meeting, and you've heard me sit here and say thank you because you've answered my question. All through this meeting, all that has been said is talk about noise, 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 noise. If you would go back and listen to the May 10th meeting, my concern was in the amount of the request and how much would the total project cost. That was my concern, and that concern was answered. Commissioner Braun Johnson brought up about the noise, and I agreed with her. I said, you know what, I'm thinking I'll put my risk management hat on, and I agreed with her. And these issues have been taken care of, and we've got the answers to our questions. Okay. So I'm not prejudiced against Pat Powell. I'm not prejudiced against the Whitby Commando Land Trust. As a matter of fact, when the acquisition list comes up next week, you'll see that. Nothing was changed midstream. The process is an application comes in. If it's an acquisition project, it goes to a board. If it's not, if it's MNO, it comes straight to us at a work session to be discussed as a group, which is the only opportunity or the first opportunity we have until it comes here. We chose to bring it here. It's here now. Thank you. Can we on the list of questions and responses? Well, uh, or, or would you like the board to ask you the questions that we want to keep up? 
information or clarification from staff, but we'll be happy, of course, to uh, answer any questions that you, the board, might have. Uh, if, can I ask one more question? Yeah. How difficult would it be to split it into like a two-year thing and it would alleviate that problem with the overage for EBITDA funds for this year, correct? Uh, Correct. You so, in the past, the board has had different structures uh, for approving funding, not only for M and L but for acquisition projects. So, if you wanted to uh, split it between years, if you wanted to phase have phases of the project, you could do that. It it's up to the board. Uh, so I I'm ready to make a motion. Unless there's other uh, questions, uh, Commissioner Johnson, do you have any you know, clarifications you've had? Well, I have, uh, I, I'm going to have comments, so um, it depends on if you want now or after the motion. Either way is fine with me. And we can do it during discussion. Sure. Okay. Well, I, I would move that we approve the Whidbey Camino Land Trust MO application with $40,000 for 2017 and $10,000 for 2018. I'll second that. There's a motion and a second to approve the application to, per, to Whitney Camino Land Trust for $40,000 in 2017 and $10,000 in 2018. Uh, is there any more discussion? Uh, well, I'm going to discuss it now. Well, I, I think that this project um, fulfills a number of uh, priorities, both for the uh, Island County's Trails Plan the Keys uh, National Historic Reserve, of which Island County is a partner, certainly the conservation uh, program in itself, and, um, and is uh, a, a good use of, of these funds. I think, I think the ethics questions, uh, I appreciate the clarification from board members that, that the comments and the request for more information um, you, you, I mean, the, the questions of ethics were not just around the Open Public Meetings Act, as we heard. Some of those were about whether that was an uh, vindictive or punitive action to ask for that clarification because of previous comments that had been made and reported in the paper. I think we all have uh, struggled with the nuances of some of the quotes that we make and how they get reported and then how the community interprets that once it's been done. I think the reporters. Uh, have a hard job to do and I appreciate that um, but there is there was that cloud over this that I thought was really unfortunate because I believe that, um, that our job is to find a way to promote all all of the aspects of Island County the the Navy base is certainly an important economic engine here as is uh, uh, the tourism economy and the agricultural economy and, uh, and the reason that many of us live here is so that we can access the beautiful trails and vistas that are available to us in Central Whidbey and, and uh, around all of Island County. And this project seems made to order for all of those. So um, my, m my thought about an outdoor trail program is that it, the community members and visitors who access uh, EB's Landing now are making choices about which part of the trails they access, when the growlers are flying, adding this uh, amenity and connecting those trails doesn't increase or decrease that. People are still going to make choices about that, but it does provide a very important infrastructure for all of us to enjoy the investment uh, that's already been made in this iconic uh, prairie. So I'm, I'm in full support. You know, I have a lot to say kind of in response to some of the things. For, for me, I, I think it's important that I'm consistent. Again, I, in 2013, I did not vote for the extension of Kettle's Trail because I have experienced with APZ zones. I know what's involved in APZ zones, and I know that the more infrastructure you put in place, the more conflicts you end up with in terms of land use compatibility. 
it's difficult for me, and, and I thought about that question that I was asked about, uh, is it retaliation and ethics, or is this well-intentioned? Uh, it was well-intentioned, but I'm not gonna deny that there's probably a small part of me that enjoyed the hypocrisy of the request, just as I was accused of being hypocritical. See, there are seven property owners on the list for the public trail we'll go over who have stood in front of us at the Board of Health and have talked to us at this meeting and said that it's so intolerable for them to be outside that they have to leave town, that they can't be out in their garden, that they can't be outside and experience these things. Well, I can't do anything about the fact that you made an informed choice to place your, to buy a house with a realtor disclosure, which is being, by the way, taken to court because it wasn't enough disclosure to potential property owners. Now we're in a situation where we'll have no disclosures to people who would be walking on a trail, and yet the same individuals who are advocating for the trail and some of the same organizations that are saying they want the trail are also ones who said that the OLF is incompatible with outdoor recreational activities in the reserve. So then I'm, I'm called a hypocrite because in one instance I didn't care about your health and in another instance I am. I would probably argue back that this is the first instance I've had other than issuing a noise study with Mr. Stella brought up, and I will address that in a minute, to address the fact that we put future conflicts in place. This is, my thought on this is in direct response to the feedback from the community. You may say that's retaliation. I say it's listening and responding to community feedback. If you can't be outside, why would you expose public to that same kind of experience? How, how do you reconcile that? Because I'm having a hard time reconciling that. In some ways, this is what, this is what you asked us to do. The part that I can't control, and I've never been able to control, is how much the planes fly and where the planes fly. I give feedback about things. I'm very clear about the weekends and the usage. I talk to the Navy in different ways and try to represent this community's interests the best I can knowing my community's interests as well. Here's a decision that, that literally, and I just, I don't know, I don't know, I really don't know what you expect me to do. Take those concerns seriously or assume those people were lying to me. That's my choice. Were they lying about it being dangerous to be outside or were they telling me the truth? I'm gonna believe the citizens were telling me that it's an intolerable situation. If that is the case, the only piece I can control is land use. That's the only part under my authority as a county commissioner. And so I'm gonna exercise that authority in protection of the community. The APZ conversation, Commissioner Price Johnson brought that up a while ago about the need to start that, and I said let's wait until we get the, what, the feedback back. That's partly why that conversation hasn't started, because there are different proposals out there, and depending on the usage, there may need to be some restrictions or not. My goal, after seeing what happened to North Whitby, is to be the least restrictive as possible. I've had conversations with people at the Navy who said just pick up your existing North Whitby code and use it. Well, that's a really restrictive code that doesn't necessarily reflect the values of the Coopville area. It restricts bed and breakfast. This is a big bed and breakfast area. There are things that are restricted, like outdoor auctions, but most of those happen on the weekends. We have assurances from the Navy that they don't fly on the weekends, and so I want a more flexible code for this area that could apply on the weekends differently than the weekdays. But we need to see the results of that first. It's hard for me personally to have sat through some of the attacks to be told it's falling on deaf ears when I, I feel like this is a result of listening, that this is a result of years of listening and consistent decision making on my behalf because again, in 2013 when the room was not full, I voted against extending Kettle's Trail, <coughs> which is a really nice trail. I've walked on it and I like it, but it, it is because of compatibility. These compatibility conversations are going to get harder and harder over time. We're going to have more and more of these moments. Respect isn't just my way or the highway. And I acknowledge that maybe sometimes I present that way and I don't always outline every thought that's in my head. 
part of where I get frustrated when people complain about the noise in the Navy is I know that the more incompatibility we have, the less flexibility we have to allow land use to happen on the ground. I'm scared for those property owners who may be wanting to do some things that are gonna have that restricted. So I've tried to hold the line on noise things. Here's something we don't have to do. We don't have to expose non out of the area public to something that they may not be familiar with. We don't have to put this infrastructure in using public funds. In fact, the land trust can do it using private funds. The people I asked to give feedback were pe people or organizations that specifically said that it was incompatible. You may say that that's retaliation for free speech. I don't believe that that's what that was. What I think that was is trying to clarify is trying to clarify the true meaning of your words. When you say it's incompatible, does that mean that you can't coexist? Or does it mean you can coexist? So we ask for clarification. In terms of the ethics with the health officer, uh, if Island County is going to participate with public funds, the health officer has expressed concerns. I wanted him to outline what those concerns were. I didn't tell him what to say. I just wanted him to clarify his concerns. Do you feel it's safe enough to put a trail in, given the opinions that you've expressed. You may call that extortion, I call it clarification. I think, um, I'm trying to go down my, my list here. You know, it's difficult, again, to hear that I don't value others, do unto others as they have you do unto you. This is the same thing that happens to my community up north as well. So I understand that you're going through this difficulty right now, if you talk to Garrett Newkirk, he comes to the microphone repeatedly telling us about how much of his rights have been restricted because of the airplane. His issue is actually with the ATC and the steps that were taken around compatibility. It, there was a ball field that the, that the city of Oak Harbor looked at putting in up near, on Highway 20, up near the, the Navy base, and that ball field got taken off the list because it was deemed to be incompatible. This is what's starting to happen. And, and just so I'm fully transparent, I've had conversations with Public Works around the ball fields at Rhododendron Park. I've had conversations with Public Works about the dog park that the county runs. I have conversations about the fact that if this comes back with really intense use, we need to be prepared to respond. Is there another place we can put the park? <coughs> those decisions haven't been made, but I ask those questions all the time. I just don't always ask them in public. I, you know, the clarification of intention is all going to be up to you. You can decide that I'm retaliatory and a bully. You can decide that I'm doing my job. Uh, you can decide that I am in love with the Navy and hate the land trust. Uh, and what I know about myself is true. I value the Navy and the things that it brings. Sometimes it drives me just as crazy as it drives you. I value the land trust and have had successful partnerships with them in the past, and I want nothing but good things for them and I don't want them to be sued like the realtors were sued by a group of people who said you knowingly put people in harm way, harm's way. That's happened in our community. Even with disclosures that were intended to inform people who are making a personal choice to buy a home, who've been given noise disclosures, those realtors are being sued. So how do you not look at the history of these things when you're making your decisions? I'm gonna vote no, that comes as a surprise to nobody. Um, and it's, it's not retaliatory, it's just because of my concern about putting additional taxpayer-funded infrastructure investment near an active military facility where they're doing touch and go landing. And, um, oh, I said I'd talk to the noise study. Uh, Mr. Stella asked a question about why not a county-funded noise study. Uh, the EPA is the lead on the noise study for the, for the Navy EIS process, not the Navy. And they are a well-funded, national federal agency that has, <laughs> that has access, Can we be respectful? That has access to scientists that we aren't going to be able to afford. So anything we do is going to be second guessing experts that that have already been paid for by by with public dollars. I, I don't see the value in it in terms of how it moves the dial. That's been my stance on on that issue, that's where I'm coming from on, on that. You don't have to agree, but that's my reasoning. So, 
Um, those are all my comments, I think, as it relates to this. I, I understand that you don't agree. I hope I've talked long enough to give some insight into the fact that this is a very complex, long game issue for me. And um, and I and we're gonna have a lot, lot more of these discussions. I'd like to offer just a couple other um, thoughts. Um, that a different way to look at this, that the, the planning grant opportunity actually provides for that chance to look at what uh, maybe there are ways that there can be a posting of uh, beware of low-flying uh, aircraft, or uh, maybe there, uh, there'll be more information that comes forward as, as this goes. The, the investment actually has already been made uh, of public funds in the trail easements. So those already exist. There's already public easement. This is just a way of maximizing that investment. And so I, th I think there's, uh, I, I like the way that this is structured in, in that it provides for further conversation around the issues that have come forward through this process and actually fulfills uh, a, a number of uh, priorities for a, a wide range of organizations. So I think it, I think we can have a win-win. I, I just, uh, I, that's why I'm supporting it. How can you reconcile how do you reconcile having to put up warning signs and then putting the public there? If you, the if public you, is already there, though. The public is already enjoying Evie's yeah. Reserve right now. This is just this not is on connecting these, trails. Not on these trails, not on these right. trails across properties right. where there's been expressed concern. So if you have to warn them, should you put them there? <coughs> so we have no warnings now, and the and people are, are experiencing it. If if that if that should come from the planning opportunity, I'm not saying that it would. It might. Uh, there's a the planning process, as I understand it. It will look at all of the uh, the areas. I, there could be. Uh, there's also opportunity, I think, to help get folks uh, from the ferry uh, into downtown Coopville, which I think it is a, is a, another high priority for economic development. Now, I mean, there's a number of things that could come out from the planning grant. So there isn't. There's nothing about this grant that increases the number of flights, or or, uh, or or what it does is connect a trail system that's uh, that already exists. And so I I, I mean it, it when when it gets built. Right now it's it, at least for the first year it's just about exploring the opportunities. And I think we we have a job to try to find win-wins for the community and the Navy. And that's what I, I think that this fulfills both of those goals. That's why the Navy has already made investments in reducing the, the development rights on these properties. The APZ process is a, is a separate process, but trails are allowed within county code. So there's nothing that exists in the template that's already out there that would prohibit this from moving forward. And until there is, I mean, I, I think we should go with that. Or should there be a need to? I don't think that even when we move forward with that, the trails would be. I think people of free will can make choices, and they are right now. So, that, I, I just thought I'd put that out and see if that helped sure. you in any way. The people with free will who bought homes, we don't recognize that the same way. No. This we isn't. A, we're, I'm not discussing. Well, homes I'm just trying to put this today. in. I'm trying to put it so, in context of my thoughts. <laughs> Hearing what you're saying. I, and I, and I, I, I get that you're thinking about it a different way than I am. Um, I'm not asking people to make investments in homes uh, with this trail application for MNO. This is, this is. We're asking the public to make an investment in possible in, development. In, in, in providing better access to an easement they already own. So uh, in, in, through a planning process. That, the, the public already owns these easements. Uh, or the, in, in conjunction between the Whidbey Command Land Trust and Island County, and uh, those there's a the, being able to have the public enjoy those investments that have already been made and and to experience the amazing historic uh, landscape of of Evie's, I I think that that's part of our job as a partner. So I I don't think that they're irreconcilable, and and I understand you do. I, I understand. I, I, I don't want to quite that way it's irreconcilable for me because it's been irreconcilable for the community that's I don't have the concerns myself but the community has the concerns so I, 
I mean, until we can work together to understand that there will be people who will be exposed to noise and we don't use that as then a foundation to file a lawsuit to go out there and sue to try to get rid of the Navy, I'm not comfortable in making a public investment. It's unwise. They believe it's unsafe. They've told us it's unsafe. So do you not think that they're telling us the truth? <laughs> I, I think you and I come at this in a very in very different directions, and um, and I I guess I would just ask for the vote on this application and know that the conversation will be continuing. So there's oh, do you want to yeah, I just I just find it like I, and I said it earlier. I think it is uh, there's been ample opportunity for those individuals and groups, um, and some of it with whose properties are on this list. Um, to step forward and say no, that noise is harmful, oh, well, et cetera, what we've heard at the health department over and over and over again. And I just find it um, striking uh, them going away from their normal mantra and not coming here and expressing that interest here. So, like I say, in, in my mind, their silence is their consent. And that, to me, this is their admittance that there is not, which I've said all along, that the noise is not a factor. So, because they because they chose to be quiet about it, uh, when well, next time they come protesting, I'm going to show them all these piles and piles of emails I've accumulated in the last three weeks, and it shouldn't be an issue. So we have an active motion and a second to approve the grant at $40,000 for 2820. Yeah, for, the, for this year for planning. Dude, Pat, I'm just throwing money your way. 20,000. 40,000. 40,000 2017 and 10 for 2018. I, I know. Totally up. I was right on that. 40,000 $40, for 2018 and $10,000 in 2017. 27, got it. I got what I did wrong. $40,000 in 2017 and $10,000 in 2018. That was my motion. Is there any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Aye. Motion carries in two with one dissension. Yes. All right. Next on.